Well, almost 20 years ago, my wife and I, we spent several years in what's called the great state of Texas. Are any of, we have any naturally born, so we were born in Texas here? Okay, I've got to shoot, man, they raise their hands fast. You don't even say anything. So I gotta be careful what I say here. But there's, a, there's Texas is a different place, okay? Uh, it's not like Southern Indiana. It's not like Kentucky. It's not like what... If you are from Texas, it's its own place, right? And so there are some unique things, uh, especially unique, about living in Texas. And people in Texas, uh, and I mean this with no disrespect, this is uh, with the utmost respect, they talk a little different than we do here. Yeah. Yes, they do. Yeah. And, and some of the words that they'll say sometimes don't mean the same things that they do for you and I. Like if I'm going to tell you that I'm going to go uh, fix and get my car, you'd think that I am uh, going to fix my car. But fixing there doesn't mean that you're going to repair something, right? It means you're about to do something, right? Or my favorite that I didn't know at all, the first time I went to a restaurant, there I walked in and uh, the lady asked me, what would you like to drink? I said, I'd like a Coke. And she looked at me and she said, what kind? I said, well, Coke. And I thought, you know, maybe they have Pepsi. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, do you want Mountain Dew or do you want Dr. Pepper or do you want, you know, Sprite or do you want Coke? I said, well, Coke. But Coke means something different there. Coke is basically, in this great state of Texas, any carbonated beverage, right? And so you have to be careful what you say because the words that you think mean something don't always mean the same things to other people. Uh, this week, we're in the second week of our series, Buzzwords. We're talking about common, commonly misunderstood, what we call Christian lingo, uh, words that, that we use regularly in church uh, that maybe people outside the church don't really know what they mean. And if we're truthful about it, maybe many of us don't know what it means either. And the reason that's important is the words that we use help to frame our relationship with the Bible, our relationship with God, and our relationship with each other. It's a word, a fancy word we use, another buzzword called doctrine. And that's really just our set of beliefs, our teachings, and so we're looking at some of these buzzwords over the next few weeks. Last week, we were looked at the word Trinity, and I encourage you, if you uh, weren't here last week, to check out that message. And this morning, we're looking at another Christian buzzword, gospel. Gospel. When you think of the word gospel, what comes to mind? Uh, you might, first of all, think of four books of the Bible. You say, well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's the gospel. Or you might say it's a style of music. And depending on where you're from, you might say uh, that it sounds urban or it sounds country. You're not sure, right? Because there's Southern gospel and then there's gospel. But we think maybe the word gospel is talking about music. We think maybe the word gospel is a type of presentation. Maybe you've been somewhere and they said, we're going to present the gospel and we're going to ask you to respond to the gospel, to raise your hand or to come be baptized. Or we have other phrases that use the word gospel, right? Somebody might say uh, that they teach a prosperity gospel. So what does the word gospel mean? Well, the, go the word gospel comes from the Greek word euangelion. Euangelion. In, did I say it wrong? Euangelion. I think I said it right. Yeah, It's a tough word, but I'm hearing a lot of people talk. What did I do? I don't know. You don't know? Okay, all right. <laughs> it's a Greek word. I think it's pronounced euangelion. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. But uh, the word gospel comes from that Greek word, and it really means the good news. And it's not just good news uh, like you should read in the paper, you know, that somebody got married, or even the good news that we celebrated this morning, that these babies are part of our body of believers here, and that uh, they're going to be raised up in the, in the Lord. The good news, really, the word gospel was often used as a word that helped people to think about, some, about a king, about a coming king, or about a victory. It was the good news of a king having victory over his enemies. The word gospel actually comes from this word, a conglomeration of words, God spell. God spell. And what it means is the spelling of the story, God's story. And so the gospel is really God's story. So, what exactly is this God story? Well, some of us, we might have grown up or heard the gospel, the God story presented to us in this way. You messed up. You need a savior. If you do what's right, you will have eternal life. Now, what's the key word that you see repeated in this over and over again? You, 
right? But it's not your story. This is God's story. And there are parts of this that are true, but it puts the focus on the wrong person and sets up a distorted view of God, of God's story, of the gospel, the good news. It sets God up to be like a demanding parent who just wants us to do the right thing and get our act together. And because we're so bad, we couldn't do it. He killed Jesus to take care of our sin problem. And if that last sentence makes you a bit uncomfortable, it should, right? Because we have, for many of us, heard that that's the gospel, that's the good news as we understood it. And it might be good news in a sense, but it doesn't feel very good. Now, this is often referred to as the bad news, good news presentation of the gospel. You might have seen this uh, often in street preachers, people who are speaking of the evils of man to draw you into the good news. And, and there are truth, right? We heard a little bit about that truth this morning as Aaron shared with us, the long receipt that we have, the sin that's in our lives, the brokenness that's in our world. But that doesn't sound like good news. Talk about how bad you are. We often say this is a way to help scare people into heaven or at least into a decision. But the gospel or the good news, God's story, is so much more than that. So instead of this being bad news, good news, I want to present this in three different ways. Part one is that we were created for good. That's the good news. We were created for good. From the very beginning, we see this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in the first two chapters of Genesis, as God creates the world and creates us, what does he keep saying over and over again? It is good. And then when he makes man, he says it is very good. He makes man his image and says it is very good. You and I. We're fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. From the very beginning, God's intention for us was nothing but good. He designed us for a relationship with him. We were created to reflect his glory, to experience his love, and to live in harmony with his perfect will. We had a unity with God. It was good. I mean, have you ever considered just how valuable and precious you are to God? That you're his masterpiece his beloved child, that is good news. That we were created for good by a good God who loves us beyond measure. But that's not what we mean when we say the gospel. At least that's not all that we mean. See, if God's story ended there, it would be different and things would be different than they are now. That God created we were created for good, is just the first two chapters of Genesis. But that's not the end of the story. The second part of God's story of the gospel is that sin separated us from God. That's the bad news. Right, we often will lead with the bad news first. I don't know how many of you, uh, when you come home from work and maybe something's happened or you go to the doctor and they will say something like, I've got good news and bad news, which do you want to hear first? Depending on how you're wired, you might want the good news or the bad news first. We often present the bad news first when we're talking about God's story, but God's story starts with the good news first. But there, are, there is some bad news that sin separated us from God. Despite God's good intentions for us, something went terribly wrong. Sin entered the picture and it changed God's perfect creation and fractured our relationship with him. You see, sin isn't just about breaking a set of rules or making mistakes. It's about rebellion against the very one who created us and loves us unconditionally and made us for good. Sin separates us from God, erecting a barrier between us and the source of all of life and goodness. That sin, it's really idolatry. It's putting something else before God. We want to be in the position of God. That's what messed up the good news, that we wanted to be first, that we wanted to be in charge. We wanted our own agenda. And we're going to look at this separation more in depth in the coming weeks. 
But let's be real. We have all felt the effects of sin in our life, no matter how good we might try to be. Whether it's through our own choices or the brokenness of the world around us, we're experiencing pain and guilt and shame. And all of that keeps us from experiencing the good relationship that God intended for us with him. And it reminds us of our need for redemption. Romans chapter 7, if you've got your Bibles, we're going to be reading from Romans chapter 7 a little bit. Romans chapter 7 verse 21 says, So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work within me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Aaron talked about those long receipts. We've broken the law. We've separated ourselves from God because of sin. But here's the thing about the bad news. It's not the end of the story. Yes, sin separates us from God, but that's not where the story ends. Paul goes on. He says, so then I remind myself in my mind that I am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, I am a slave to the sin or slave to the law of sin. And he says in chapter eight, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he commended sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And this brings us to part three of the gospel, of the good news that Jesus restores us. This is the good news part two, right? The sequel. That God sent Jesus to make things back the way they were intended to be. God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, into the world to restore what was broken, to reconcile us to himself, and to offer us the gift of salvation. And this good news... It wasn't fueled by God's anger, but by God's love. See, often when we lead with the bad news first, we view God as a God who's just angry at us for making mistakes. And so he made Jesus take care of the problem. But this God that we serve, this good God, isn't driven by anger, but by love. John chapter 3, verse 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Let's look at this verse here again. God so loved the world. Notice Jesus, who's speaking here, didn't say God was so angry with the world. The motivation of God is his love for us. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. This God who loves us, who saw us as good from the beginning, has given us an amazing gift. I mean, if God was angry, why would he give us a gift? Now, I'm not saying that there isn't an anger, what we call the wrath of God. We're going to talk about that in coming weeks. But God gave his son out of love. He gave us his son. That whoever believes in him, now the word belief here, it means more than just something in our brain, just thinking something's true. It's an action word. It means to commit and following Jesus begins with belief and continues with devoting our lives to him. And that's why accepting the gospel, the good news, God's story, is more than just a one-time decision. It's a daily decision. 
You didn't accept the gospel once. You accept the gospel every day that you're alive. If you believe this, if you commit your life to this, commits is following, being changed, and being on mission. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, to commit, to believe in him. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That those who are faithful to Christ will have life forever. Not just life someday, but life now. He goes on, God did not send Jesus to condemn Now, while God had every right to send Jesus to condemn the sinful world to death and destruction because of his love, as the verse started with, because of his goodness, because of his goodness and his love, he didn't send Jesus to condemn us, but that the world might be saved through him. See, that was God's plan all along. The good news is that we can be saved through him. That God wants to save us from the condemnation, from that long receipt that each of us has. Now we can choose to not accept the gospel. We can make that choice to say God's story, I don't want any part of that. Romans 8 verse 1 tells us what happens if if we do that. That therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Which means... If you're not in Christ Jesus, you've made a choice. See, Jesus lived the perfect life that we could never live. He died the death that we deserve, and he rose again victorious over sin and death. Through his sacrificial love on the cross, he paid the price for our sins and made a way for us to be reconciled with God. That is good news. Paul summed it up this way in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you've received and on which you now have taken your stand. By this gospel, this God story, this good news, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word that I preached to you, otherwise you believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as first importance. In other words, the most important And here's what it is, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the 12. You see, the gospel isn't just a nice story, it's good news. Romans 1.16 says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. The gospel isn't just a story. It's the power of God. It's the good news that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And here's the best part. This offer of salvation is available to each and every one of us. Regardless of our past, no matter what our receipt might look like, from the week or the day or the year or our life, regardless of our past or our failures or our mistakes. John chapter 6, 37, Jesus said, All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. All we have to do is receive it by faith, and allow Jesus to come into our lives and transform us from the inside out. So what will you do with this good news, with this God story? The good news, the bad news, and the good news part two. Will you embrace the truth that you're fearfully and wonderfully made, created for good by a good, loving God? Will you acknowledge the reality of your sin and its consequences on your life? And will you accept the free gift of salvation offered to you through Jesus Christ? That's the gospel message for you. The good news that God wants you to be back with him. How he originally intended for you to have relationship with him and relationship with each other. And that's available to you. 
the good news. Now, if today you find yourself in need of this gospel, of this good news, and you want to know more about how can you have that in your life, I want to encourage you after service, come up here. I'll, I'll be up here. Come talk with me. Or I'll put my email up here on the screen. If you want to send me an email, we can get together and talk about what it looks like for you to have that good news in your life. For you to recognize the good God who wants so desperately for us to be with him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not die but have everlasting life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the incredible love story of redemption that you have for each and every one of us. Thank you for creating us for good, for pursuing us despite our sin, and for sending your Son to restore us back to a good relationship with you. God, I ask that each and every one of us would accept and embrace that good news of your grace and to live lives that reflect your love to the world around us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.